you may be a Rubik's cube, but there's a solution to it. And so as a result, you know, you're not going to solve the Rubik's cube in, in 19 dates, maybe. It, it may take 119 dates. But if we know what we're looking for, uh, our odds of solving are a hell of a lot better. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Beat Your Genes podcast. This is episode number 335. And in today's episode, Dr. Lyle and I are talking about romance as one of our listeners is struggling to find men that she is attracted to. Our second question is about Dr. Lyle's infamous 10 paid dates rule and whether or not it is outdated. If you don't know what the 10 paid dates rule is, it's one of, from one of our older episodes before we went to YouTube. I'll put the episode up right here. And since we're on YouTube now, you'll have to find the audio episode either on our website or just your usual audio podcast platform to check it out. So let's jump inside, see what Dr. Lyle has to say. Everything's fine. You know, the, I've uh, got, uh, uh, the, the show we did last time, you know, a lot of people wrote to me and talked to me about, about uh, John McDougal and my tribute to him. And, you know, we just sort of did it completely off the cuff, but uh, I think it, it, it came out the way you would want it to come out, which is just, yeah, you know, just talk, talking from my memory and everything. The, uh, the, yeah, so it, that's good. You know, life moves on and we, we uh, remember all the lessons that, that we learned from from uh, his life and what he taught us, as well as everything that we else we learned along the way about it. And on we go, you know, and the Google program will uh, continue on and hopefully continue to be successful. And, uh, and you know, nothing, uh, nothing about that message uh, uh, will be changed as far as I can see. Uh, everything makes as much sense as it always did. Yeah, it speaks to how how comprehensive Dr. McDougall was, is that it can live on even when he's not here. Yeah, very much like Nathan Pritikin, uh, same same kind of thing. That's, you know, thank goodness, because that way, that way, you know, the 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 utility of all of the effort and work that he put in and dedicated himself to will continue to touch, you know, uh, many, many more thousands of people uh, in the years to come, which is great. It, it, it is a message that can turn people's life around. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. All right. All right. What well, else? Yeah. yeah, well, we're going to pivot a little bit uh, away from the diet discussion, and we're going to talk a little bit about romance and dating. So got a couple of questions in the queue uh, for that, yeah. Dr. Lyle. So, All good. Okay, so our first question is, uh, I'm a 41-year-old female. A combination of good genetics, good diet, exercise, good skincare, staying out of the sun, have allowed me to look like I'm in my late twenties, even though I'm actually 41. I've always looked younger than my age and I have what people have called a baby face. I'm not at all a narcissist, but I would rate myself a nine out of 10, even at my age. But as a result, I don't find any of the men my age to be attractive. I've dated men in their twenties and they were definitely attracted to me, but they were turned off once they found out my age, even though I look much younger. So my question is, is how do I get myself to be attracted to men my age? I currently find them repulsive. Um, that, that's a, kind of a bizarre question. Uh, the, the truth of the matter is, is that <clears throat> there, it, it would be almost impossible uh, to believe that there are not men between 40 and 45 that this person would find attractive. Okay. So it it, it would in, indeed it, what what is she what she's suggesting is something that um could theoretically be true, but would be extremely rare and tragic. And that would be that that um that effectively she's so picky that she's picking up the extremely subtle differences. Uh, she could also be somebody that is, is born with, for example, um, a hypersensitive chip around aging cues, which wouldn't surprise us any because the sensitivity to aging cues would be a, a genetically, you know, basically a bell curve distributed characteristic. So she could be, in fact, sitting at the 99 percentile or sensitivity to male aging cues, uh, which would mean that that uh, her market then uh, is going to be 
uh, narrowed considerably. In other words, if you happen to be a freak uh, relative to a specific, you know, inclusion rejection criteria criterion, then that then that's going to make life tough on you. So if you're if you're a guy that only likes girls that are five, ten, or one hundred twenty pounds, you know, life's going to be tough. Um, and you're like, what am I supposed to do about this? And it's like, well, let's hope you've got enough attractiveness to be able to uh, uh, basically narrow your search to people of an extremely narrow set of characteristics and you're able to be attractive enough to attract some percentage of that market. So there are going to be extremely youthful looking men that are between 40 and 50, okay? There will be men that are 47 years old who have a little bit of baby face to them that are extremely attractive people and that people are going to think that they're 37. Okay. And uh, uh, meanwhile, of course, we can't rule out the obvious, which is that there's no reason in principle that she might find a 35 year old that is exceptional uh, and therefore and that he isn't interested in having children and it doesn't bother him a bit that she's 41. You know, my my best friend, Alan, married a person, you know, a decade his senior because that exact thing happened. Uh, I mean, that, that that's exactly how that went down. So the um, so anyway, so the point is, is that your the solution to the problem is you, you're not going to take a, you know, a crescent wrench to your skull and try to bang it up and to, to get, have your mating search criteria change. That's not gonna happen. So whatever is in you is in you and you have to deal with whatever it is that that is. The, um, now, I have, just as a point of fact, um, I have met numerous women that have told me the following story. Uh, I, I will now recall one of these stories from 25 years ago. Um, and that was, this was a, a young lady who was very attractive that was telling her, me her tales of woe that amounted to a story that sounded a lot like this. And um, she was only attracted to this very certain physical type. And, you know, it was really hard to find that physical type. And it turned out that, that, you know, the, the first boyfriend that she was all excited about physically was that physical type. And the, then, you know, since that time, this or that, whatever the heck the story was. But the bottom line was I had reason to be connected with this person for the next 10, 15 years. I actually, she's still a friend of mine to this day, but we, we don't talk very much. But what happened over the next couple of years was that she tripped over all kinds of people that didn't meet those narrow criteria. It's like, and so finally she said, you know, at the end of the day, I think I misunderstood what I was attracted to in guy number one. What I was attracted to was dominance. And she said he was, he, you know, he had a certain body type and he was very dominant. And that is what was super exciting to me. And so then when I met other people, you know, they didn't have that characteristic. And so I was assuming that it was somehow associated with this morphology. But it turned out that then she met people that didn't have that morphology, but had the dominance characteristic and found herself getting her bell rung again. And then finally threw up her hands and said, I don't even have a morphological characteristic. OK, which was interesting that it was interesting enough to me that 25 years ago, that conversation and that person's odyssey actually filed its way in my head. And I thought, is it that interesting? Their intuition about what was acceptable to them was different than what was actually acceptable to them. They had misidentified the characteristics, which is fascinating. Now, the, um, so, um, that, I think what we're going to find is that what we find appealing in people, uh, my theory about how this actually works is that there are, you know, probably some X number of, I mean, we could call it an infinite number of characteristics because in principle, we could say 
well, the proportion of the elbows to the hands, you know what I mean? This, this, the cubit to the fingers, you know, the truth is I'm sensitive to that. And I have actually seen that kind of crazy stuff in myself. And I've had it reported to other people. Uh, there was a very handsome doctor where I worked and a friend of mine, I said, you know, well, I mean, that, that guy's, you know, the cock of the walk, obviously. And the response was, no, his proportions are a little bit off, you know, <laughs> the pointy <laughs> elbows strike again. <laughs> <laughs> so the point of that, the matter is a long answer is that, um, that I think that what you really have is you've got probably some number of physical criteria that we can categorize. And it's probably in, in probably less than 10 measurements. And uh, of those 10 measurements, at, at what you have is you've got um, you've got sort of a continuum of acceptance. So if you could take a look at one of the characteristics physically or psychologically, you can immediately say, oh, that definitely qualifies. Like, you, you know, for sure, there's no question that qualifies. OK, uh, so for myself, if I meet some woman that's five foot five, it's like height is absolutely not an issue. Like it's not even close. Okay, so the uh, if I meet somebody that's really tall, I have to tell you my 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 infamous phrase is if I feel like she can block my shot, I'm not happy about. It. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's true. And of course, that's consistent with male female dynamics around the globe. Typically. Females want people six inches taller, men want women five inches shorter. They, they compromise somewhere in that, those ranges. So, and there's latitudes of acceptance. In fact, you could be somebody, uh, an extremely tall basketball player had, uh, you know, a seven footer actually had mating preferences of women that were five, four, which is sort of interesting. It's like, it's right on the biological mean of the species, uh, basically. But it's fascinating that the fact that he was, God knows, you know, a foot and a half taller than everybody else didn't make any difference to his preferences, which was fascinating. Mm -hmm. The um, Now, where am I with all this? So what you've got is you've got a whole bunch of characteristics that you're tracking. And your adapted mind is actually running a calculus on the overall mate value of this human. You know, how they move, what their voice sounds like, how tall they are, what their body morphology is, what their facial construction looks like, what their age is, you know, their their vocabulary, the um, their assertiveness, their, you know, all kinds of things, the, the social assets and physical material assets that they have amassed or not amassed, the uh, what they what what it looks what they look like with respect to various and assorted hierarchies, what our friends think of them. It's like, wow, this is a really, really complex mating calculus that sits inside of the human brain. And so the um, and what we're going to find is and what I've seen many, many times in my career is somebody will basically say, you know, this is a favorite thing from Lost in America with Albert Brooks. You know, what wonderful movie that everybody should watch where. He's like practicing with his wife about what salary he will accept. And he's like, he's and they're, they're offering him and he's like, it's not going to take anything under 50,000. And so she'll say, OK, well, what if we pay you 45? No, no. And he's practicing with her. No, no, because he's getting ready to negotiate. And so he goes to the interview and they say 49. And he's up out of his chair with his hand out. <laughs> <laughs> which means that he was willing to take less than he thought he was going to take. In other words, he didn't actually know his own mind until the moment hit him, which is going to be true of, of a thousand and one love stories where I just can't, you know, st have sand anybody that has sandy blonde hair. You know, I really want a guy with dark hair. And next thing you know, she's hanging out with Brad Pitt with his golden locks and everything, she's all excited about it. Okay, so, so all I can tell you is the following, whoever this person is, and I don't know anybody is, that when you feel cornered by the fact that you believe 
that your mating preferences are making this impossible, which is exactly what this person is saying. They're saying, this is impossible. My mating preferences, I'm in such a strange situation that she's actually alluding to the fact that because I look perfect, basically, in other words, I'm no different in principle than if I was 30. So because of my unusual genetics, I am not having reality pound me over the head and therefore recalibrate me into, into the second class status that it should have me in at 41. Okay. So thereby here I am stuck, you know, able to compete on an attractivist level with the most attractive men. And what the hell am I supposed to do about that? Because the men that are my age are completely unacceptable. I'm totally turned off because I'm hypersensitive to aging cues of men. Wow. Sounds impossible. Okay. And I would say, yeah, that's almost certain to be BS. Okay. Next thing you know, we're going to meet, you're going to meet somebody with gray hair that it's going to be, that's going to be a phenomenal human and suddenly it doesn't matter. Okay. So the truth of the matter is the, uh, probably the, the most potent characteristic that this person is not actually attempting to farm when it comes to male, uh, females seeking males is, uh, and this was astonishing that I talked to many very high IQ women about this issue that had not identified this as a characteristic really. They hadn't conceptually identified it, even though it would turn out to be a critical characteristic in their, in their actual responses and decision-making, which is character, okay? So the truth is, is that you, you don't necessarily know how important characterological issues are to you. And one of the problems with the modern environment, a grand thing about the modern environment is your ability to eat, to meet unbelievable numbers of people you know, in principle. A curse is that you are not knowing their character when you meet them. That's a problem because in the Stone Age mating processes, you would have known their character when, when you were meeting them. That, that, that would be a major component of your assessment of them. And it would be embedded inside of your aesthetic judgment. And the truth is you couldn't disentangle it, okay? It's just your aesthetic judgment. In the same way that what a guy smells like relative to your, your histamine immune complex, you can just find that you're just not attracted to him, it's flat, and yet you can't put your finger on why. But another guy that is objectively no better or inferior winds it up being very attractive. And it turns out that when we we do an assay of his sweat and we find out what's actually going on, it turns out that that could be an extremely important feature about why he's attractive and the other guy isn't. And yet you wouldn't be able to know it. It would be it would pass underneath your conscious awareness of what that is. And so it isn't that character issues are are that we are out without awareness of them. But the problem is, is that real life and dating and meeting people superficially, they do not, they do not, uh, uh, it's like, it's like men trying to meet women who are all dressed up with veils and huge flowing robes. And we don't have any idea what their body morphology is. It's like, well, I don't know. I can sort of tell by looking at her face through the veil and I'm listening to her voice and I'm trying to watch how she moves, but I don't know if I would be attracted to her because I can't see the critical information. And the same thing is going to be true of you know, modern superficial meeting. You know, if a guy is particularly bad character, we may be able to pick it up. But if he's an exceptional character, we're not going to be able to tell the difference between exceptional character and average, not on a date, unless average is worse than I think it is. And I've got reason to believe from some female reports that it is worse than I think it is, because I think that a lot of guys are horrendous on first dates, even when they're interested. So but I, I think the difference between a 75th percentile character and a 95th percentile character could easily be impossible to detect. On, on a date when people are on good behavior and they're motivated. And as a result, though, that difference of 25 percentile or 20 percentile could be have enormous consequences for your ultimate aesthetic response. And so as a result, again, 
I, I, I told uh, many women this, you know, if a guy, if you can't rule them out, then don't rule them out until at least, you know, say three dates. And at three dates, you're just like, you know what, I'm just bored. I feel nothing. And fine. But that's fine. But at, at, at time one, what you should be thinking is, hmm, I feel pretty flat, except it is an interesting human. Ding, 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 ding. Okay. That's super interesting that that's what you're feeling. You're not feeling you should have a defense against sexual chemistry to stop you from making a mistake, you know, cheaply and easily, unless you're looking at some particularly sexy characteristics that are pushing you over. And that, that's a different thing. That's casual mating strategy. And there's a reason why that exists inside of the female psychology. But generally speaking, most babies that have been born have not been born in the, in the history of humanity behind casual mating strategy. Some of them have been, but most of them have not. And most of them have, have been the result of a female warming up to a male after she has mapped his psychology. And so that's what I would tell you. In other words, if you find the person interesting, give the guy a couple dates. Second date, they can they can look different on day two than they did on date one. Okay. Why? Because you are now integrating who they are into their aesthetics. And now you're finding your 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 adapted mind has to go through that process because characterological issues, i.e., behavioral issues, predictive behavioral issues about who that individual is, are absolutely germane to your gene survival, and therefore they're part of the calculus. Okay. So the so anyway, so what would I tell you? Uh, you've got a large lot of cards to play with. There, you you've got a massively large world to play in. Unless you're in, I don't know, Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, at which point you're in trouble. But if you're in Dallas, Texas, you're not in any trouble. And so as a result, you've got a massively high market to play with. There are 10% of men that are 41 years old that are in the top 10 percentile for not only looks, but also for youthfulness. In other words, there's some X that is involved here. And so... Uh, so once again, if you're asking me what the solution is, numbers game, and also triangulating on characteristics that I believe have hidden evaluative components and influence inside your own nervous system that you may be unaware of, okay? And the most important one would be characterological issues. So um, as my friend said, it turned out for her, it was dominance. It was like, huh. Did you know it took her a while, it took her 10 years to kind of put her hand on that, and then she realized that's what the whole damn thing was. It wasn't actually about body morphology the way I thought it was. The um, so in this case, um, my best estimate of the biggest variable that sits hidden inside the female brain is the analysis of a male's character, okay? And so, I believe that that. That is what then you need to, if you suspect high character, you then you give that person more time. And then if nothing happens, nothing happens. But giving him more time was not a waste of time for you. Right. I was I was looking through this question, kind of thinking through that, uh, that you know, when I when I look at this, uh, I, I was imagining like a, a coin. If you flip a coin, it's fair on both sides. It's going to be 50-50. But if you flip oh. it 10 times, it's almost impossible that it's going to be five times heads, five times tails. It might be six, four, could be seven, three. But you flip it a hundred thousand times, you get more information on it, and it starts to approach the correct yes. odds, the 50-50. And I look at it like, you know, if women, the, the most valuable resource on the planet is the is the 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 female's sexuality, her her eggs, essentially, from a from a DNA right. standpoint. And so, so as a result, the women are going to be much females are going to be much more careful about getting so much more information to make sure that there's that they're that they're giving up that resource for a fair trade. And so they need a lot more data than 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 just physical. And so if you go on one date or you even just swipe on an app. That's you're not going to get enough data. You're only getting looks and you may only get a superficial aspect. You may not get enough data to actually ascertain the person's character. Yes. Um, yeah, that, that's how it's exactly right. Including um, photography is going to be 
a very limited, it's a hell of a lot better than nothing, but it isn't, it is not nearly as good as an in-person meet. Okay. Or video video is better than that. And in-person meet is even better. In other words, there's all kinds of subtleties uh, about who a person is that you can pick up a lot in video, but you can't pick up the whole enchilada. You just can't do it. And so uh, I think it's perfectly smart for women, attractive women like this, who has a lot of option, uh, options that should be having a lot of people hammer on her. Um, her whole thing is about trying to be selective about where it is that you put your time and energy. Uh, somebody like that, I would demand and utilize Zoom. And uh, and I would have you know the equivalent of 15 to 20 minute dates. I'd get really good at a standard little set of questions, acting really innocent, but actually bumbling our way into some fairly important characterological minefields for people. And um, and so uh, and so therefore, uh, and meanwhile, I, I'd be get good enough at that that I was able to what we, you know, in music, in jazz music, you call it just play. In other words, I, I don't even have to be thinking about it that much. I've done it so damn many times that, I mean, I can tell you probably the first time you and I recorded Beat Your Jeans eight years ago or whatever it is, I probably had some tension about it and a little anxiety about answering the question. Now I don't even think about it, okay? So in the same way, by the time I interviewed 5,000 prisoners to do psychological exams on them, you know, it's like I could do it in my sleep. And so uh, and that's the same thing you're doing, by the way, when you're cross-examining husbands who the wife suspected cheating. It's nothing other than you're just running down a criminal. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not that hard, by the way. So uh, so word to the wise, if you call me with, with a problem like that, you know, it's not going to be too hard for me to smoke it out. <laughs> so um, but in the same way, this this young lady um, is could could get very good by the time you've done 50 Zoom interviews with with people. You're going to get good if, if you know that what we're doing is we're, we're, we're doing a gestalt thing. We're picking up a bunch of stuff. But one of the things that we're aiming for that's going to be a chief decision-making variable for ourselves is knowing where it is that this whole system is super weak. And where it's super weak isn't in IQ, because you can pick that up in two minutes of conversation. And it's not in looks, you're getting what you can out of video. No, it's character. That's the big thing that's missing that is not coming in with this thing. It looks like a legitimate assay of a situation, but it's not a legitimate assay of the situation. It is not the same assay that you would have made in a Stone Age environment. And as a result, you know, this is not what happened at work, church, and school of all the romances that have gone on for the last hundred years in the Western world, that you are doing something completely novel. You're stripping away one of the most important elements that is, in fact, the breaking force on, on human female sexuality. And so as a result, you know, that's why I would use this. And then it'd be like, OK, well, that was nice talking to you. Hey, you know what? I, I'd like to talk to you some more, but I want to talk to you, you know, in a few days. Fine, then we'll have Zoom number two or everybody else we just get rid of. And then now we do Zoom two, Zoom two. Hmm, intriguing. I seem to like the person a little bit better. I've warmed up 10%, but I'm not, you know, my, you know, I'm not jumping out of my underwear. But the truth of the matter is, is that I can feel warmer. Okay. Now, now the question is, that guy's now worth meeting for, for you know, coffee, for God's sakes. So that's that's how I would go about that business for, for somebody like this who can afford to be very selective. I would make absolute intelligent use of Zoom and then I would meet people. And if we do that, it's a numbers game. You know, just had somebody that I pushed on this really hard that was giving me not dissimilar noises to this question. And that individual tripped over somebody, quote, miraculously about two months ago or three months ago. And so uh, sometime in the last few months, a quote, little miracle occurred. Now, we don't know if the miracle is going to continue. But the point is, is that for the last couple of years, it's been, I don't think that this is going to work. I think I'm doomed. And I was like, no, you're not doomed. You got plenty to trade with. This is a numbers game. It's an effort game. It's a, you know, you, you need to go through this process. And if it turns out that you do a really intelligent job and you lose, well, then you lose. 
Okay. I don't know if this person feels like they're under the gun for finding Miss Wright for a kid. Mr. I mean, that's a that's a different issue. But if she's not, then I can tell you, you are really sitting in the catbird seat. Because if you don't, if you're not working against the biological clock at 41, I don't know if you are, but if you're not, all you're really looking for is a superb relationship. Hey, take your time. Okay. But you are, you there is no way that you are checkmated by this problem. And there's no way that we need to bang into your skull a different way of evaluating people so that you'll somehow open your latitude of acceptance. That is not possible, okay? What we can do is make uh, get you smarter at gold mining. Okay, there's a thing called gold ore. It's, they're not nuggets. Like you have to realize, oh, there's gold in that ore. It's got rose quartz in it, okay? That means I should look harder in there because I might be close to gold. That's how we go about this process. What exactly could we get herself to change to be attracted? Are we going to change the optic nerve? Are we going to change the 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 part in the brainstem where the optic nerve meets the brain? Are we going yeah. to turn the DNA that codes the information from the optic nerve that now sends all the signals to the cells to start moving in directions? This is how we get ozempic. You find a little gila monster that that starves its prey and and then no. try to adapt it. I don't know. I don't think we're going to be able to do that successfully. So it's, no. in my mind, it's a worthless proposition to try to get yourself to change your attractiveness. Right. No, all, all we can do is assume that you may be a Rubik's cube, but there's a solution to it. And so as a result, you know, you're not going to solve the Rubik's cube in, in 19 dates, maybe. It, it may take 119 dates. But if we know what we're looking for, uh, our odds of solving are a hell of a lot better. Well, speaking of 119 dates, Dr. Lyle, our next question is about the age old question uh, about, you know, how many dates to wait before sexual activity. And so long, you know, if uh, our listeners who maybe are, we've, we've had a number of new subscribers in the last few weeks. Uh, if you want to go back to previous episodes, uh, they can look at your, your ideas for 10 paid dates, but maybe we can get a little bit uh, more, uh, kind of a re rehash again uh, from our current question, which is, uh, dear doctors, Dr. Lyle, is the 10 paid dates rule outdated? I spoke to many guys about this and they said to me that if a girl waited for 10 dates, they would assume she's not attracted to them and then move on or that she is just using them to get free meals. They said that if they pay, they also want something in return. A few have also said that sexual compatibility is a factor in deciding whether to want a relationship with this person. So they wouldn't enter into a relationship with someone that they didn't know they are compatible with. So for these reasons, do you think that by following the 10 date rule, women are missing out on great guys who are misinterpreting their intentions? Um, that's a really, really good question. And I would say that the following is true. Uh, 10 pay dates is a rule of thumb that is essentially telling you, it's telling you something about the, an estimation of the male's lack of understanding about what his motivation is about. So the, the male does not know this, but he's got uh, multiple potential motives that are what we're going to call context dependent. So um, he, as he discovers more about the female characterological structure, um, he could be either more motivated or less motivated to pursue a long-term relationship. Now, we already know that he finds her sexually attractive or he wouldn't be spending any time and money or effort trying to get to those eggs. So we already know that she meets essentially the lowest rung of criteria, minimally acceptable physical attractiveness, or he wouldn't be there, okay? Unless he's got some other social agenda, okay, which he might. In other words, it might be just calibrating to find out whether or not this girl will go out with him, okay? So, but, uh, so it's not like there wouldn't be, in principle, other motivations. But by and large, we can assume that if a male asks you out for date one, he may not be attracted to you at all because it's an internet. That's all he knows about you is from the internet. He hasn't seen you walking around the office. If he's seen you walking around the office, has interacted with you a little bit and chatted you by the water cooler, and now he asks you out, you better believe that it's because he's been undressing you for the last two months and he's got a plan, okay? So 
So we're going to assume that the female, that the girl is sufficiently attractive and the male is motivated sexually. That's why he's there. Now, the uh, so now the question is, there's an enormous difference between a man's desire to have sex with somebody and to live out his life with them. That's a pretty big divide. And so men are are very built very differently than, than females should be, just in the same way that men analyzing their fighting abilities multiple times a week, typically, and a female will do so maybe a few times in a lifetime. Um, so men are have significantly different psychologies, and that's going to be around the, their excitement and predilection towards casual mating, i.e. short-term mating. It isn't that females aren't interested in short-term mating, but again, personality and context dependent. Most females um, I, I had, I, I met uh, an attractive and open female in the last year. Uh, and I, we, I was talking this over and I was explaining about what casual mating, I mean, just like she didn't know what it was. She'd been, uh, she'd been through life. She was 40 something. And so she was knowledgeable about the world. But I said, and casual mating would be blah, blah. And she goes, yeah. Like instantaneous rejection about the idea of going to a bar, meeting some handsome guy, you know, making out with them, get, taking them home to her apartment, having sex with them, and then doing that next month with somebody else. Like no interest in anything that remotely looked like that. That was a disgusting picture. And when anything like that had happened in her life, she felt disgusted and used. Okay. So the male would never feel disgusted and used. It's like, oh, that's disgusting. Where can I get some? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So so now 10 paid dates. So 10 paid dates is my instruction to women. Uh, I don't know. If we had if we had four digits on a hand, it would probably be eight eight dates. So the reason we have base 10 is because we got 10, 10 fingers here. Okay. So the, um, so it's just a rule of thumb for God's sakes. And, um, but it's, it's my analysis of kind of what it takes for men to get to know you well enough to know what they really think of you and where you rate in their pantheon of opportunities and experiences and whether or not you're the fanciest damn thing they've seen in five years, which is more or less what it takes for that guy to fall in love. Because that's pretty much what that is. In other words, uh, a male is going to have a mating career. And if if you aren't the fanciest thing he's seen in quite a while, he's not falling in love with you. If six months ago he was sleeping with somebody that, that he thinks is fancier than you, and then they broke up for whatever reason, Trust me, he's not locking down on you anytime soon because he's feeling like, yeah, you're pretty good and you meet criteria for casual mating strategy. But no, I'm not putting all of my life effort behind you because I've had somebody that I think is better that accepted me, at least superficially. And then if she rejected me later, well, well that was bad luck and I got something to work on and I'll play my cards better next time. But the point is, is that she definitely indicated that on a, a basically pretty decent assessment, I was of her caliber and therefore I believe that I can get that caliber twice. And so I am not gonna go in on this. So this is basic, basically resource acquisition strategy that's built into the brain. That's um, why it's hard to get hired if you're the first person that's interviewed for a job and they've got a hundred applicants. It's like, well, I don't know how, I don't know if you're going to knock me out of my chair. I got some other people to look at. That's exactly what is taking place here. Oh, honey, we love this house. It's got everything we asked the realtor for. Yeah, we're going to go see about seven or eight more and make sure we can't get a better one. Okay, there's no way that that would work that way. So as a result, the, the mate search algorithm inside that head is basically, hey, are you the fanciest thing I've seen in a long time? Okay. Well, how is he going to know that? Well, one of them is going to be his assessment of your mate value appearance wise. He might say, well, that's, you're the fanciest thing I've ever seen. That doesn't mean he's willing to invest in you. The male is going to be doing a much more comprehensive investment uh, analysis of that female's mate quality 
as he arrives at his overall assessment of her mate value. Okay. And so, yes, her looks are a big deal. And yes, he picks up a tremendous amount of information about her mate value in date one, but he needs a lot more data than that. He's going to need a lot more data than that when it comes to the amount of investment that the female is typically seeking, which is an enormous percentage of what, what it is that he can produce over the next 20 or 40 years. So as a result, this is a major investment on the part of the male. And so he's willing to do short-term mating very quickly, date one, day two. There's a few males out there that are like, no, date one, that seems a little too flaky, i.e., Anybody that's willing to sleep with me at date one, I don't know that I want to sleep with them, okay? Because I don't even know what the hell that is. So a lot of men will would feel that way. But they wouldn't feel that way on date two. So day two feels about right. <laughs> okay. Well, the, he is a long ways away from, uh, he may suspect that this is the best thing he's seen in five years. But he's still learning a lot. She's still guarding a lot of stuff. There's dirty laundry he doesn't know about. They don't have enough situations where aspects of her personality have arisen under conflict of interest. And so as a result, he's still doing a hell of an assessment, even though it's all systems go in terms of casual mating strategy. It, it's, uh, you know, it's like, hey, listen, you know, I, I'm willing to order something in a restaurant if somebody says, yeah, that's good. But I'm not willing to buy the freaking restaurant. It's so like, that's a whole different analysis. If I had to make a choice on that meal at this restaurant, and it's like, and this is the only thing that you will ever be able to eat at this restaurant. In that case, I'm looking at that menu super carefully before I make my choice. So anyway, so is 10 paid dates out of date or out of step? No, it's not. And the truth, how do I know this? Well, I know by looking at female mating psychology, we find out that the average ma female who's 40 years old has made about one new mate choice every three years, for God's sakes. It's like, oh, this thing is pretty conservative. It's a hell of a lot more conservative than you imagine listening to rap music or watching T, you know, pop television. It's like, eh, or The Bachelorette or whatever the hell it is. Like, trust me, that this, this machine is far more conservative than the outgoing, wild, extrovert, open, sexualized human beings that you see playing, playing uh, characters on the screen. The truth is, is that the average female is pretty damn conservative, okay? And as a result, the, uh, the, the, the male is kind of aware of this. Uh, the female can advertise aspects of that by how much skin she shows and, and other adornments. But uh, and then how it is that she acts with him psychologically and flirtatiousness. All these things are part and parcel of the equation. But the bottom line is, is that that if that male find, it continues to get information that basically says, hey, I didn't learn anything on date three that rules you out of, of long term pair bond strategy. Oh, now he's upset and getting frustrated and feels like the female's not into him. When he, of course, asks her out again and she says yes. And he's like, well, I'm not sure what I'm getting out of it. I'm down like, you know, three times 50 bucks. I'm down. I'm down 150 right now on this thing. Really? 150 against a lifetime partner and the mother of your children? No, that's that's no price. So anybody that has that kind of bizarre calculus in their head, I don't think you want anything to do with them anyway. What you want is what you would have seen in a Stone Age situation where a male feels over-rewarded, extremely interested. He wants to hang out with you all the time. He wants to ask you a thousand questions and tell you a million words as he's trying to tell you everything he can tell you about why it is he's incredibly sincere, every asset that he brings to bear to the equation, to be quietly and, and reluctantly honest about his weaknesses as he leaks those out to you one wave at a time, as you can synthesize his strengths, as you are very slowly possibly accepting his DNA to be your children, for God's sakes. Why shouldn't you be conservative? He knows that you should be conservative. And if you're not conservative, his eyebrow is going up. Now, you can signal that you find him physically appealing, make out with the dude. That's fine. That's telling him, wow, I'm not being ruled out on, on the basis of chemistry. 
That's all he needs to know. It's like, Ben, if you're still holding out, it's like, yes, I need to know about your character. I need to know more about how much you like about me. I need to hear you freaking say or sing me a sonnet for a while. In other words, I'm going to need reassurance before I effectively open myself up to venereal disease and pregnancy, for God's sakes. Okay? So, no, it's not out of line. And when I have talked to men for 10 years after this has been sprung on the world in, out of my mouth, probably 15 years ago in psychotherapy practice, that I've been talking about this and I've told women about it. And the truth is, is that the women will find some joker that they weren't even that interested in anyway, but they were kind of thought he was attractive, got shitty with them after day two or day three, and now they're all upset and now they're not sure. Now, three months later, they meet a freaking prince who's outstanding, and they are carefully moving through this thing, and he's not pushing it at all at day five. And it's like, why? And the answer is, that guy is believing that this is the best thing he's seen in years. He is absolutely playing pair bond strategy, and he is under no push to get to those eggs because once he gets there, he's basically thinking that I may be there forever. So what's the freaking rush? Okay. But when they aren't thinking that because they are unconsciously calculating that this, that I may not be playing pair bond strategy, that in fact, I got a lot of circuits unconsciously that are telling me that I'm actually paying, playing casual mating strategy, although it's a confusing montage between those two things which is a designed lack of insight or self, uh, 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 basically self-deception in order to make him a better liar, in order to look like he's playing pair bond strategy while he pushes for casual mating strategy so that he can get into her pants at day four. Why? Because God forbid we don't want to have to pay for dinner again, i.e. it's all about trying to get to the eggs without having to pay the price. If you are thinking short term, you are very concerned about the price that you're having to get to get there. If you're playing long term, you don't give a rat's ass. John Tesh, I believe, I could have this wrong, who is this handsome, blonde musician, talk show, Entertainment Tonight host, you know, held concerts all over the world. My memory is, is that that guy got his, his hooks into some beautiful supermodel, as you would expect. And that guy had no pressure on her. None. Okay? You can imagine what that guy's mating career could have been or probably would have been behind casual mating strategy. But when he met somebody he was serious about, it's like, yeah, I think they waited till they were married or some damn thing. It's like that same thing. Uh, Corbin Burnson and, and Paulina Portsakova. Uh, I same thing happened. I was paying attention 30 years ago to these very dynamics. And Paulina Portsakova was like, no, guy was super patient, no rush at all. In other words, this is Corbin Burnson, man. This is LA law. It's as slick as it gets, right? Uh uh. Okay. Meets Miss Wright, and it's like, I'm in no rush. My only rush is I want to make sure that I'm the only guy you're looking at. That when I ask you out, yeah, you want to go with me. We hang out, work together, moving around like a little two peas in a pod. Why? I want to make damn sure because I believe I'm going all in, but I'm not going to get cuckolded by you sleeping with somebody else when I, my back is turned. So I'm barely controlling or omnipresent in your existence and wanting to have an ongoing conversation and I'm wanting to go all around, but I'm sure as hell not counting the money on the hot dogs. Okay. And I'm not counting down. So last thing here, hey, you know, everybody knows the, the infamous Larry that we'll, we'll bring on the show once just because we, we told so many Larry stories. <laughs> but Larry was a freaking absolute tomcat of the first order. He was a rock and roll drummer with hair down to his shoulders big, strong guy, and quick-witted, pretty good-looking. Not Probably not as good-looking as he thinks. <laughs> <laughs> Just got to throw that in there. But, yeah, I mean, now he's now, now he's older guy. He's, he's, he's ancient. He's older than me. But the point is, is that, that he was cool as shit, is what I'm telling you. 
And uh, and so Larry, you know, had no problem in the in the you know after the show. Okay. The uh, but when he met the one, no rush. That went on for a while, and Larry was like, he had no problem, and he 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 could recount. And finally, he recounts the story of one night he was getting ready to go out uh, with Cheryl, his wife, and he's like washed with face, and he's looking in the mirror, and he looks at himself in the mirror, and he goes, "Tonight's the night." <laughs> 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 yeah, that little calculus had gone through his head and said, totally faithful female. I've now vetted the hell out of her for several weeks. I know, I suspected this was Miss Wright in the first five minutes. And it turned out that it was. And here I am now quite a bit later. And that's it. I'm ready. And that is, is the entertaining story. Yeah. So, uh, So that's why... And that was a hell of a lot more than 10 paid dates. So the, uh, as Larry said, no, we just like hanging out together. Yeah. Just like hanging out together. Okay. So if that, you know, that's what that thing ought to look like. That's of course what it looked like in the stone age environment. That's exactly what it should look like. And if not, if it's one, two, three, four dates and I'm going to get laid, we know what that is. Okay. So yeah, great question. All right. All Dr. Right. Lyle, thanks so much. My pleasure, Nathan, and uh, we'll we'll run this back and we'll see what we got in a couple of weeks. All right, sounds good, Dr. Lyle. Have a good one. Gotcha. I'll see you soon. Okay, bye bye. That's it for this episode. I really appreciate you watching, especially uh, for those of you who made it all the way through here to the end of the video. If you have questions that you'd like me to put in the queue to ask Dr. Lyle, you can send them in through the website or email me directly. Uh, this video, I experimented with the editing to have the full view of Dr. Lyle when he's explaining. So let me know what you think about that in the comment section or email. Uh, thanks again very much for watching, and we'll see you all next time.